Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim, and our guest today is Roger. So, Roger, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Hi, I live in Redondo Beach, California, in SoCal. And what I do for a living is uh, I'm in the free diving, free dive hunting. I call it free diving. It's not free. It's, it means diving without an apparatus. That means breath hold diving or skin diving for the old timers. And um, I call it free dive hunting, not really spear fishing. I mean, it is spear fishing because it is very specific. We're not spearing from a boat. We're not spearing on scuba. And we're not necessarily spearing also. We can be shooting videos, taking photos. It's hunting. Like we hunt mushrooms in the wild. We're not picking them. We say mushroom hunting or safari shoot camera. So it's free dive hunting. That's my specialty. And the wetsuits. I make specific special wetsuits for that sport. Awesome. So how did you get into this? Is it, was it more of like a hobby or like, yeah, I'm curious to say more about your story. Yep. It was a hobby and kind of a way of life in the sixties of last century when I was like a preteen. It was normal. You go in the ocean to swim and catch fish. It's like, I wasn't the only one people, you know, like love to bring fish to the table. So we used to hunt and fish and these were totally normal, uh, activities, sports, on the food gathering, right? So that's how I used to do it. And then the internet happened in the late 80s, early 90s, when news groups were formed. And I realized, you know, hey, uh, after I moved to North America, because I did it in the Med, in the Mediterranean, in my childhood and my Where did you live before? I'm Lebanese from Lebanon, so I was in Beirut. And then uh, from uh, Beirut, I went to Canada, Montreal, and then... uh, Beginning of the 21st century, I met my future ex-wife in New Orleans in a diving exhibition and uh, moved to California. I've been here since, okay, since 2001. Awesome. awesome. So, yeah, I guess like it's one thing to have this hobby and even like a way of life. But what inspired you to actually start this business and sell your wetsuits? Okay. It was a hobby and I was in the entertainment business. I had a, a record label and a recording studio. I was in the music business in Montreal. And actually I was pretty up there in the music business, singing telegrams, clowning shows, conventions, you know, the whole enchilada, booking artists, etc. Now, when I moved to California, that was just before September 11 happened. I had already started with a company called Picasso. It's in uh, Europe, in uh, Portugal and Spain, and they manufactured and marketed and sold free diving gear and equipment. It was the whole line from the from the wetsuits and neoprene accessories, masks, snorkel, fins, spear guns, and spear fishing accessories. They didn't touch scuba. That means scuba stands for uh, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. No tanks. So it was the motto was thanks, but no tanks. I'm free diving. And then it was in its infancy, the sport, in the late 90s or mid 90s of last century. I was involved as an amateur, not yet, as one of the, you know, divers, not, not as a business. And then in 95, I started, people started asking me, saw me on the beach. Hey, what do you use? Can I get that? Where can I get that? This is special. I've never seen those things before. They're way too long. I never seen, so, et cetera, et cetera. And... I got in it as a business in 1998 and I represented the company and uh, I was the first diving or even water sport sold online ever. I mean, we didn't even have a shopping cart. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm talking before Google, before the Explorer. Microsoft didn't even have a browser. So we had to play around with JavaScripts and hire programmers to be able to do a shopping cart that only Netscape could run. I don't know. I mean, you're, yeah. I don't know if you remember those days, but I mean, you're too young. But I'm just saying that yeah. it was, yeah, when I sold online, the only way to sell was to have a static website that was before dynamic website and then have managed to uh, uh, acquire 1877 wetsuit, phone number, it was toll free. So 
And then when you want to order the 187 toll free number, and I was answering in Canada. And then, yes. yeah, and then I moved to California, had the first free dive shop. So the first free dive shop, I created it, I founded it. And then years later, that was in 2002, years later, I sold the controlling shares in the company because I wanted to focus on my brand because I introduced that kind of wetsuit to North America, which was an open cell wetsuit with camo. So camo, nobody knew existed in wetsuit. People think, are you going for duck something, waterfowl? So I came to North America with that and I moved the company because I got married here and had a child, my girl. And then it went on from there and I focused on my brand, Yazbek, because everybody wanted to know how the wetsuit was made. And I used to make it for Picasso, actually. So I went to China, taught, because also in China, they never made that kind of wetsuit before because it's a different technique. It's not rocket science, but it is labor intensive and it takes artists to build it, not just any work. I mean, I went literally to art schools to hire the guys with the best and the girls with the brush, usually also ladies. They are fine brush because the application of the glue, it doesn't hold by stitching, but by gluing. I mean, I don't want to bore you with the details. And then... Years later, the Special Operation Command, the military, the Navy, Navy Special Warfare, discovered that suit. And then they started testing it behind my back for several years. And then eventually they called and they say, hey, this is amazing. For I mean, this is, we're going to ditch the dry suits. And they signed me up for a pretty large contract, the first wow. ever. And uh, I've been supplying all the SEALs team. Uh, SEAL teams, that's all they were, the Special Ops. Amazing. And now the Europeans, the British. Uh, special operation, uh, the SBS, SAS, diving, all, they're wearing it. And it's been like this since. It's a niche, but it's uh, very demanding. So I'm focused on wetsuits right now, mostly. Right. So what is the breakdown of your business currently, like in terms of percentage? Like, you know, what percentage is the government contracts versus direct to consumer from your website, retail? What does that um, breakdown look like for you currently? Okay. Before the government stepped in, like and the orders came in, it was 100% consumers. And, right. of course, international. So I have dealers all over the world, distributors, dealers, mm. and the website sale. And then when the government stepped in, it was 5%, 7%, 10%. And then eventually it grew bigger, but I started also investing a lot more on, on the retail to maintain the government below a certain percentage because otherwise you know it's any business knows it's dangerous anything yeah. goes over five percent so uh, right now i have developed uh, uh, one wetsuit just for the government under their request because they i got uh, during right. a meeting of the department of defense long story they said i gotta change the nomenclature or the appellation there right. from wetsuit to something else can be a wetsuit because they can't place order for freezing water north of alaska sheet which is like 28 degrees at, at 20 feet, 29 at the surface. Mm -hmm. Nobody dive in a wetsuit except the one I designed. So the purchasing officer or the contracting officers couldn't use the term wetsuit. So I changed it and I trademarked it for strikes, which is super thermal retention Yazbek combat suit because they use it for combat. It's a suit you wear, you go in the sub, you go out of the sub, you operate, you come back, you don't touch it, you don't take it off or on, and you're in freezing temperatures. Hey y'all, it's Dan Melnick, the CEO of Zing. And I wanted to share a special offer for all of our listeners. Right now, if you need software development services, we'll give you two weeks of a free trial. Do you need to update your website? Do you want to build a mobile app? Do you want to update something that you've been working on for a long time? We've worked in a high level technology like AI, machine learning, blockchain. So shoot me a text, 817-874-2208. Thank you. Makes sense. So is most of your business today this direct to consumer channel? Or are you selling mostly wholesale and like other retailers? Like what does that look like for you? Okay. I used to have a lot of retailers, like dive shops, nuns and pops. Of course, COVID stepped in. That was BC before COVID. And then when COVID came in, of course, the dive shops took a hit like everybody else, all the other stuff. But then my wetsuit or the Yazbek wetsuit in particular is a fragile suit. It's like a, it's like a triathlon suit. Think triathlon suit. You cannot go to a store and just try a triathlon suit. You'll rip it. Right. If you're used to get, getting a surf suit or 
those regular suits i'm not going to name brands that are like 80 bucks and you can step on it in the parking lot and jump in the water and drive your car over it and it's still intact that's not the suits we can use you know for uh, you know when you do sushi your knife is five thousand dollars <laughs> you're eating sushi not means you know not ground fish so uh, the same thing. It's a performance way. So, um, well, yeah, we're, we're just talking about like, you know, breakdown because you mentioned that before COVID, um, yeah. you had lots of moms and pops, but right. you know, they closed down. So you've had to kind of change, you know, make some changes in the business. Yeah, because the shops, it was a problem. People go in, they want to try it. The shop owner or an employee, just give them a suit, they rip it off because they don't know. So it was an education, not really just selling market. I have to educate the divers and the shops and the employees of those shops, just like I did even with the military. I, I used to mm -hmm. go for fitment and testing and sit there with all those top divers in the world. They're not like just any, I mean, I'm sure it's the 1% of the 1%. It's the best ever anywhere. I mean, you know, uh, and then they still are getting acquainted you know, introduced to that. So it's an, it's an educational process. Hey, this is a, a Ferrari. You can't take it in the field. You can't just drive it in the city right. and, uh, and the, over bumpers. So, okay, it doesn't mean it's a bad car. If it breaks down, it's $10 million, but it's just not made for that. So uh, it, it is, so the dive shop started, I started to kind of walk out. So I stayed with importers like wholesalers or specific shops that knew exactly what they're doing. There's a couple mm. of them, Florida, Alaska. Uh, these know because the customers who go there go dive in glaciers, for example, in Alaska. They have the private helicopter. They know mm. exactly what they're doing, but they need the suit. Like BBC photographers up north or the Project Ice X, where the water is like, hey, you can't do it there. I mean, you'll freeze. You go into hypothermia within, uh, within a minute. So they know what they're doing. So these people, I'm not worried that they have these kind of customers. So in this particular case, a dive shop can be used. Otherwise, it's direct. So you go on the website, order all over the world. We, we deliver to people who know. And if they are unsure, they call, they write, and I tell them. And they, that's why it's a niche. That's why it's a slow mover. Right? But, Got it. Hmm. So essentially, like, you know, you built this brand over, you know, 20 plus years and People know who you are, obviously. So in terms of getting new customers, since it is so niche, like, do you run ads? Like, how do you go about acquiring your customers in 2024? Good question. I never ran any ads anywhere. I, in the times of Picasso, when I was in Picasso, like 20 some years ago, I did because it was a brand and it was competing against a ton of other brands. But when Yazbek launched, I mean, my own competitors, I made their suits. Right. I'm not going to name the names, but all the big names people know that I made the suit. Now, some broke away eventually. Even my own employees and factory, everybody thought they could do it or they, but I mean, the formula, the, the Coca Cola formula is here. You know, it's a, I mean, it's not everybody needs to advertise. Absolutely. Right. I mean, it doesn't matter who you are. You have to have, in my case, I did not because it, enti it entitles a lot of follow up because. It's a kind of complicated because being the niche it is, if you put a dollar of advertisement, it's hitting not in the right, you gotta yeah. have the right market for it. Otherwise you're wasting it. And what That's happens, it. let's say I put an advertisement on Facebook and Instagram and multimedia for Black Friday. You know, I have people calling and say, oh, I don't know how to wear this. And, and then it's so much energy wasted. So then I'm at my age, I don't want to be a teacher every day, like 20 times. Mm. That's the thing. But eventually, if I form a team, which probably I will soon have to, because the government now is asking me for very compliancy. They want to step in. And I'm going to probably have to form a right. team then. Yeah, I would do it. For sure. So... Obviously, um, you know, as you mentioned, you're one of the first websites. I mean, you're very forward looking when it comes to technology. So in 2024, many companies are using AI, artificial intelligence. So I'm curious mm. if that's something that you've used or if not, like where you think they can be bring you some value. It's what you mentioned is good. In when I dot com, my last name, it was for personal before I started my brand. I also dot com Picasso America dot com. Incidentally, I own Picasso.com also, which is the painter, which is another story. But when I was Picasso, Picasso America was 
when Alexa used to belong to Yahoo and it was the creator. Today it's called the waybackmachine.com and it's been bought, I think. But Alexa, then, I'm talking Alexa 30 years ago, 25 years ago, rated the website. So MSN was number four. Yahoo was number one. Google, that was just as Google started, maybe number three or number five. I was number 14,700. All websites in the world. So there was nobody. Yet. I mean, today I would be one in a billion, you know. But then, today, when I was young enough to see the internet coming, because I used to watch things. When, when they had the internet bubble, if you recall, 2000, I was laughing. So bubble, it hasn't just it, it hasn't started. What do you mean a bubble? I lived in Montreal then, and I'm going, what do you mean it, they busted in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley? This is this a joke? We didn't even start. We didn't even have cables yet. I mean, we cable had just started. It was still dial-ups at 64K, and then I had to pay $800 a month for an ISDN, 128, fractional, just to give you an idea, and they busted. And I'm like, but I aged. When you are in your late 30s, 40s, you have an energy level you don't have when you're pushing 70. And then I'm going, oh my God, AI, this is amazing. I'm, I'm testing and I'm going, I'll never get into this because it's like starting to read encyclopedia today. It's, you know, an A. And for me, no, 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 no. I want to go fishing. I want to go diving. <laughs> Just, I'm going to hire a young team. Maybe if I get bigger contracts because I think it's amazing what you can do with this. For sure, yeah. There, there's so much potential nowadays when it comes to technology. It's good to be ahead of the game. So I always ask this question, and I'm curious, right? If you could go back in time to before you got started, what is the biggest piece of advice that you wish you knew? That I was not immortal. You know, there are, we cannot go back in time. I mean, I don't know if you know the poem with, about Khalil Gibran about the fear. It's the river that's going down. And it is afraid because it sees the ocean. It's gonna, it can't go back. Nobody can go back. But if I can go back in time to one event concerning, I have to identify the event. I'm allowed one event. Is it health? Is it family? Is it a move I did when I, because I lived in many continents and I worked and I have multiple right. citizenships. Uh, what is the decision I would not have made or I would have made. Are we talking business? Are we business, talking business. Business. Yeah, this is your business. Yeah. I would have followed my own advice. I read a book in 1980 that was written by uh, Sherban Schreiber. He's a French philosopher. Was passed away. Jean-Jacques Sherban Schreiber. I remember. And I was in Saudi Arabia working as a, a, a com as a, a in a com mechanical electrical contracting company. I was in Riyadh for three and a half years. Right. And that book was so ahead of time. The name was Le Défi des années 80, which means the challenge of the 80s, because it was in 1980. He launched that book to tell the people what the challenge of the 80s would be. Remember, we had just barely had a microwave oven in the house. We, it was like, wow, a luxury, right? No computers, right. no PCs, no cell phones. Cell phones came 1985, July 85. When I read that book, I was, uh, I was an assistant commercial manager in Saudi Arabia in a contracting company. And I go, oh, the book was all about, it will be computers. It will be all about computers. Never mind construction, never mind this, never mind cars, never mind oil. The, 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 construct, the, the, the fortunes were made already with oil. Oil is already lagging, uh, what do you call it? The, the big contracting, the, the developers are, will be lagging. There will be a lot of competition. Computers are where you have to go. I should have learned then Rather than stick to Saudi, I, I had no choice. I was drafted to the war. And it was a long story. And I wasn't yet American or Canadian. So I, was, I couldn't move anywhere without a visa on a passport that I could barely get. I mean, I wasn't even free to hold my own passport. It was held in a safe at the company. I couldn't even leave, just to give you an idea. But if I could have or I should have maybe fought for it was go learn programming and computers. Then. That's and great advice. Yeah, that's the, awesome, that the awesome. advice. If I could go back. So if somebody watching this podcast wanted to reach out to you, do you mind sharing your website or social media? I guess best ways to get in contact. Oh, uh, my website, you have it. It's yaz, my last name, uh, uh, Social media, Yazbek Wetsuits at, on Facebook and Instagram at, at Yazbek. I don't play along too much with it. I have a webmaster who, who does it because I'm kind of overwhelmed. And uh, I am always here for advice and uh, for, you know, going diving free diving 
Awesome. When I can. Well, Roger, I want to say thank you so much for doing this and thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, we're uh, rooting for you. Oh, thank you for inviting me, Daniel. Thank you and have a wonderful day and happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of July. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Thank All right, you. Bye. bye. bye.